November 21st, 1994. Donkey Kong Country was released for the Super NES, and it changed the world of action platformers forever. Thanks to the team at Rare Studios, known as Rareware back then, the stagnating Donkey Kong franchise was revitalized because of this first smash hit. The game would go on to sell 9.3 million units. This is the story of how just one of those sold cartridges made a difference in my life. This is my personal story about Donkey Kong Country. First, a little history. I was born in 1983, making me 11 years old when the hype for this game started. While I was a die-hard Nintendo Power Reader and Nintendo Loyalist at the time, I never would really obsess over a game coming out until I caught the Donkey Kong Country fever. I mean, I loved Mario, Mega Man, Castlevania, Metroid, and Star Fox, for sure. But Donkey Kong was something I didn't have much experience with outside of the Donkey Kong 3 machine at my orthodontist's office, which certainly made the wait for the visit that much better. Donkey Kong was a game that I just honestly didn't have that much interest in. By that point, I was used to huge, sprawling adventures in games, so an arcade style wasn't my go-to excitement in gaming. Donkey Kong was brought into the 1990s with the revitalized platformer we're talking about today, as well as a puzzle platformer on the Game Boy that same year. But what changed me into a fanatic? The answer was the Donkey Kong Country exposed VHS that arrived at my home. It's, it's like, whoa, and it blows your mind. It's all the shading and stuff. It's really well shaded. Everything looks so rounded. And you're really going to think that it's a game that's a generation ahead of its time. Yeah, it's brilliant. Last second timing stuff in there where you have to jump real quick. Yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people are going to be surprised at the kind of uh, game that Donkey Kong Country is. Looking back on this little slice of the 90s, I have fond memories of watching this promotional video over and over and over again. Seeing the unbelievable graphics courtesy of the core system of advanced graphics modeling, also known as ACM. They'd create these wireframes for the characters that would act like the bones and then fill in the actual character's visual design on top of that. It was incredible to see behind the scenes for the very first time. Meanwhile, seeing all the footage of the monkeys and gorillas really got me interested in the animals themselves that were used as an inspiration for the design of the characters. I remember I used to go to Toys R Us every so often, and one day after seeing this video, my dad took me to the store and they happened to have a playable kiosk with the game there to play. It was only a few levels, but I went nuts over this. I would beg my dad constantly to bring me back to the store so I could try out the game, eventually mastering the first two or so levels that were featured in it. I was hooked. From there, the wait began, but I was used to this, as just a few years prior, Zelda Link to the Past, my favorite Zelda game of all time, was my very first pre-order, so I knew what I was in for. But every day felt like an eternity up until release time. And so I started with a pre-order thanks to my parents. The store gave me a promotional shirt that anyone could have gotten if they pre-ordered the game, but I wore this thing constantly. My parents must have gotten sick of washing it. Donkey Kong Country poured into everything in my life. I was obsessed. As soon as the Nintendo Power Super Fun Club announced merchandise, I asked for all of it for Hanukkah that year. The must-have items were the soundtrack called DK Jams, with a Z, because 1994. There were even some toys that I was lucky enough to get for Donkey and Diddy. There might have been a hat as well, but I can't remember that far back. After the game came out, I was one of the first kids to get it in my class. And because I talked about it so much, there were people who also showed interest in getting it. But the game also showed me the darker side of supposed friendship, and also got me into a heap of trouble at school. At one point in time, during 6th grade, I had a report to do, and I decided to research gorillas for it. I can't remember the specifics of the report, but I researched the heck out of it at the library. And when the day came, I brought in my Donkey Kong toys as a visual aid, wore my Donkey Kong Country shirt proudly, and gave my oral report to the class. It went over well enough, but there was a kid by the name of Mark who started making fun of me because of the shirt. Middle school was rough for me. Growing up, I didn't have a lot of friends, and when kids found out that I was Jewish, I got made fun of for being different. Plus, being overweight and having glasses was just more ammo for them to use. But, for whatever reason, Mark's relentless insults towards the shirt felt like a jab at my love of this game. And, 
For whatever reason, it was the final straw. Years of pent-up aggression towards people who made fun of me all came to a boiling point, and I had no other way to pour out my anger other than on Mark. He died that day. No, I'm kidding. We got into a fight, which was mostly just me pummeling him. I got about 10 or 15 good punches in before the teacher broke up the fight. But what I remember most about that day is, despite me winning the fight, I remember bawling my eyes out. Not because I knew I was going to get in trouble. I did. I believe I had like three days detention or something like that. But I just remember getting all that anger out of my body through my fists. And how it didn't make me feel any better. My parents fought pretty much all the time, leading up to a divorce at the end of 8th grade, and I think the fighting that I was seeing kind of buried itself deep into my feelings. It wasn't the first time I'd get into a physical fight, but it was definitely the most emotional I've ever become during and after one. Looking back on the shirt itself, it's pretty ugly, and my attachment to it was mostly just due to the love of the game, but then again, I've never exactly been the pinnacle of fashion. Quite the opposite, in fact. As I said before, I didn't have too many friends back then. My brother was too little to appreciate video games or music or any of my passions and hobbies since we had seven years between each other, with him being born in 1990, so I mostly just hung out by myself at that time. I played a lot of one-player games, and I still do to this day. It's not that I dislike multiplayer or I'm antisocial, but experiencing things on my own allowed me to escape into the world of video games and kind of get away from all the stuff going on in my real life that I just wanted to stop dealing with. So when the opportunity came knocking to enjoy my passion for Donkey Kong Country with a peer, I decided to give it a shot. I had played video games with other people before and had two-way friendships that I really enjoyed, but this was some Someone new to me, someone that I went to school with who previously showed no interest in being my friend until I got Donkey Kong Country. His name was Steve, and when he found out that I got the game, he asked to come over so we could play it together, and we did. I started a new save file for us, and we would play through the game until we finished it. Shortly after that, I remember calling him as the months went by to check out other games. Mortal Kombat 2 had come out by that point, and I tried to see if he wanted to come over to play it with me. My other friend Joe and I would play Mortal Kombat pretty consistently, and I became enamored with Killer Instinct the following year. But as the calendar pressed forward and the seasons changed, the constant excuses rolled by. My young mind started to realize that Steve had no interest in actually being friends with me, he just wanted to play the game that I owned. It was then that I learned an important lesson that people will use you for their own personal gain and nothing more. That they could fake friendship to a level of deceit, and it started to add up. We didn't talk much during school time, except to make plans to play the game. And he had a whole batch of friends that I was friendly with, but didn't hang out with regularly, because I didn't have an in. I remember being really hurt by all this. I couldn't put it into words at the time, but talking about it now makes me realize how important this game was to me. Of course, all of this is a faded and distant memory of a simpler time in my life, but these life lessons and moments kind of stuck with me. I'll always have a deeper appreciation for Donkey Kong Country. It taught me a lot about myself and about other people. Happy 25th birthday, and hopefully I'll be able to reflect again on the 50th anniversary down the road.